The Enfield Poltergeist. Now what can I possibly say about this case that hasn't been said in the media, apart from my own personal opinion? Now, it's obviously been covered worldwide that the Enfield Poltergeist occurred between around 1977 to 1979 and a little outburst in 1980. Uh, a single mother, Peggy Hodgson, was a 47-year-old divorcee with four children, two boys and two girls. And uh, they lived in a council house in Enfield in London. I don't need to tell you it was Green Street. and I'm not going to tell you the number. But um, the activity uh, centred around the two girls, Janet and Margaret Hudson. Uh, Janet was 11 at the time and Margaret was... Uh, 13. Now it all started on uh, the Tuesday evening of the 30th of August 1977 when, as you do, you put the children to bed and you don't expect any nonsense. Peggy was there just downstairs and it, she could hear all this ruckus upstairs and uh, she went upstairs to sort the children out and um, she went into their bedroom to tell them off, you know, stop messing about, you know, you've got school in the morning or whatever it was. And uh, they were making this noise, but the girls denied it all. They said, it's not us, ma'am. You know, it, the beds are shaking. And then all of a sudden, Mrs. Hodgson could see the, um, the drawers that was up against the wall pull out on its own, you know, unseen forces. Um... The case itself is very similar to my own personal experiences that happened to me in Wales many years ago, and it happened longer as well, where uh, the Enfield poltergeist happened only about 18 months or so. And uh, anyway, yeah, anyway, um, Peggy Hudson, naturally this freaked her out and she went next door. They all fled the house that night and... Uh, to the Nottingham's house. Now, one of them, it was either Vic or his son, that went there to investigate, to see what it was all about, you know, as you do. And they heard this um, rhythmic tapping, tap, tap, tap. But it wasn't any other tapping that you heard, you know. He, he was a builder, I think, as far as I know. He's, he's long since passed away now. Um, but he didn't know what it was, he just didn't. And, um, yeah, oh, it's really scary stuff. The police were involved as well. Now, I, I can't think for the life of me why the police would get involved because they are not the sort of people that you would um, contact. It's not the first thing you'd think of. Well, let's call the police. I think my house is haunted. They wouldn't be able to deal with that, would they? Because they deal with crime. But anyway, nevertheless, they duly arrived. And uh, it was a, a male police officer and uh, a female police officer, Caroline Heaps. I wonder where she is these days. And uh, she made a statement. She said she personally witnessed uh, the chair moving on its own, believe it or not. Um, she said it moved a few inches and she checked for any uh, thing going on, like any suspicious things going on. She checked for wires, but she could find nothing. But anyway, they, she, they tried to calm the family down and... Uh, they said, well, there's nothing we can do because there's there's no crime being committed here. And again, that's, that's very similar to my own experiences at Dadson Villa in Wales. Now, this is why I'm so fascinated by this uh, this case. But there was poltergeist activity, which could be anything, uh, which I may explain later if I remember. Um, Lego, there was uh, marbles being thrown around, apports and stuff, and uh, hot to the touch. And it was hitting people and this is when it went all crazy the local press was involved actually it was the daily mirror and they were called douglas bentz and uh, graham morris and it was graham morris who said in an interview more than once that he was hit on the head or by the eye with um with a lego brick lego being the most popular toy back then as it is still now um i used to play with it as well you know lego and uh Graham Morris was the one that took photographs uh, and this is when it hit big time, this is when it became national knowledge 
Um, yeah, it, it, it became, and then it's on the front page, I think it was. Now, you don't do that, do you? It's usually put in the back or in the, in the middle somewhere. Um, House of Strange Events, I think it was. I must have heard, I, that's when I first learned of it. And my grandmother being interested because we were going through the same thing at the same time, but we didn't have the press involved because my grandmother feared ridicule. So, but anyway, this family, uh, they called it because they wanted to reach out and somebody to help. Uh, but we didn't do that as well. It was suggested, but like I said, my grandmother, Rita, very similar to this case. I mean, Peggy Hodgson looked like my grandmother. One of the children was named Bill. And my grandfather was named Bill. There was things on the on the wall saying, I am Fred. The family friend, our, our family friend was Fred. Um, too similar, isn't it? Poltergeist activity, it could be anything. What I find with poltergeist activity is, if, when I've done a thorough research of it, is that it could be a rational explanation for it. It could be, uh, it's, it normally deals with metal objects like teapots, which was be, being turned over and stuff. So, um, under controlled uh, circumstances, the they, science recognizes this as real. It, it, the phenomena is genuine, it's, it is real, it does happen, and science recognizes that, but they've got a rational explanation for it. They say it's uh, magnetic fields or, uh, or something like that, and it, it, that could be possible. But this is Lego, plastic. So that's blown that out of the water, hasn't it? Um, but like I say, the uh, also the SPR was involved as well. The uh, uh, Society for Psychical Research, Morris Gross was involved, as was Guy Lyon Playfair. Now, Morris Gross in the interviews always comes across as very sincere and genuine, and I took a, a liking to him. I wish I met him, but he died in 2006, 86, I think he was. And he would regularly go and see the family and investigate um, whereas Guy Lane Playfair wanted to expose it as a fraud, as a whole, but he en ended up writing a book called This House is Haunted. <laughs> How ironic is that? Uh, he didn't expect to stay there so long, but he ended up staying there for the whole duration of 18 months, I think it was. Uh, yeah. No disrespect to Morris Groach, it's like he wanted to believe it because he lost his own j j uh, daughter, which incidentally was called Janet as well, whose um, his daughter, Janet, was killed in a car crash. And strangely enough, the boyfriend she was with was from the Caffili area and Janet Gross, um, Morris Groach's daughter, died in Cardiff, which is not far from us. Do you see how all this seems to link? Um, Poltergeist activity has got similar things. I don't know what it is. Uh, but the voice. I was listening to that voice. Some say, or oh, it's Morris Gross, his voice. I think it's Janet. This is where Morris himself was doubting it. He said, that voice is coming from you. He said, no, it's not. It's coming from the back of me. I'm very doubtful myself personally because I could do a similar voice like that without my voice getting hurt and um, it was investigated there was a uh, ventriloquists there other experts as well and say it was coming from the false vocal cords something like that uh, uh, Morris uh, what was it Gray Morris was taking photographs of the apparent levitation now when I was living at Glass and Villa I never made voices like that, well, apart from when I was trying to be a Dalek, because I was very much into Doctor Who then, which I still am now. Uh, and I would try and do the voice, and I was trying to do that voice for my daughter Samantha, and, and, and it made my it hurt my throat, so I can't do it anymore. We're well, not very good anyway. But I digress again. Um, the levitation, I never levitated. And I saw those photographs, and it does look blatantly obvious that they seem to be jumping off the bed. If it was levitation, then obviously it would be levitating off like that and not jumping off the bed like that. Her hair is... But I, I don't know. It's inconclusive, really. I mean, at the end of the day, you and I wasn't there. And that's the be all and end all of it. We just wasn't there. We never went... Well, not in Enfield, anyway. Um, I'm, I'm inclined to believe some of it. 
uh, yeah, the voice. Um, I'm doubtful. Uh, but then the, the, there was Bill Wilkins, who apparently previously lived in the house before them. And there was uh, some sort of inconsistencies, which you have to look up on Google. But he lived there before, and he was 72 years old. I am Bill Wilkins, and I died in the chair. I had a hemorrhage. Uh, do I believe the voice? No, not really. And then, like I say, it's like Chris Frencher. They, they could have learned of uh, who lived there before them as well. Skeptics. Um, they were definitely caught out. They were definitely playing tricks. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and they were. Um, even Morris Gross himself admitted that the girls were messing about because he caught them on audio tape. He's had his tape recorder, as you do. And uh, he caught them out playing tricks. And they, they hid his tape recorder. Oh, let's hide his tape recorder. And we said the public guys did it. Um, but I, I do think that they were copying what they were experiencing anyway. I mean, how can you not imitate something that you don't know? You can, you can copy things like tap in and stuff. Uh, yeah. So, my own conclusion to wrap it up. Um, hoax or genuine? You decide, but this is my opinion. I would say, just thinking long and hard about it, both. The girls definitely asked about it. There's no ifs, no muts, no buts, no maybes about it. They definitely, but like I say, they were imitating what they were hearing. Um, yeah, it's it, like I say, it started off genuine, but they were they were definitely copying, and they wanted to keep it going for the attention. I, I think that this case got far more attention than it actually deserved, because I think at, at some point it died down, but the girls kept it going for the attention. That they wanted a father figure, because like I say, Peggy Hodgson, uh, who sadly died in October two thousand and three, uh, yeah, but hours went on for seven. Or was it nine? No, nine years. And my mother and I are the only ones who talked about it. It got about, but it, it was never. But anyway, they, they made a film about this. And it was a television series as well. They got The Conjuring 2, which I watched with Nicola. And to be honest with you, I thought it was a load of rubbish. It started off good, started off quietly as, as it is. But that's Hollywood for you. That's the Hollywood treatment. Because believe you me, in reality, when. Um, they say it's, on a, it's based on a true story. It, it doesn't really happen like that in the films. Uh, uh, in real life, like it does in the films, I mean. We never had any stick men or nuns. Uh, and Lorraine and Ed Warren. Uh, the one was a medium and the other one was an extra large. <laughs> but, um, bum. Uh, but they were hardly there. Uh, but in the film, they were... They were the uh, sort of like center of the uh, of of the investigation, when it was really Morris Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair, and it was Guy Lyon Playfair that told Ed Warren where to go, because what they wanted them to it was pound signs. There was money involved with this, and uh, but that's basically it. And um, I thank you so much for watching. I hope I didn't bore you too much, because like I say, I do a little bit of everything. Now, obviously, um, I'm gonna go. And uh, say thank you very much. The Celtic Druid, over and out.